Hi, Congresswoman. Welcome. Hi, Thanks. good morning. Afternoon. Is it afternoon? It's morning. <laughs> Just about depends where you are, but we're so happy to have you with us. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. How are you all? Doing all very right, no, probably staying. Okay. We have Mr. Takano on as well. <laughs> Congressman Takano, welcome. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for uh, having me. Thanks all. Well, we can get started. Uh, thank you again, Congresswoman Davids, Congressman Takano, for joining us for this Brown Bag Lunch series. My name is Hector Colon. I'm the president of the LGBT Congressional Staff Association. I'm also senior legislative assistant for Congressman Max Rose, which I believe both of you have a relationship with. Uh, it's great to have you here with us. Uh, we're doing this in partnership uh, with the Congressional LGBTQ Equality Caucus, uh, of which you two are distinguished co-chairs. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, Sean Gaylord, as well as Laura, for assisting in putting this event together. And as you know, uh, you know, interns and junior staff at all levels across advocacy groups and certainly in the House uh, are really the backbone of this institution. And, you know, one of the amazing things uh, that interns get to experience is, you know, interactions with members. And as you know, due to the pandemic, uh, that interaction, you know, is certainly not as much as the interns would like. Uh, so, you know, we're truly, truly honored to have you both with us uh, to talk a bit about yourselves, you know, about your great work, uh, both as co-chairs, but also just your great work in Congress. Uh, so these interns can get to meet you and get to know you. Uh, so we thank you so much for your time. Uh, so the format of this, we'll just jump straight into questions uh, for the benefit of your time uh, and for the members. We got some amazing questions from folks that signed up. Uh, and again, if folks can please uh, keep your mics on mute uh, and your cameras off if you're not one of our panelists. Um, so, you know, I'll introduce, you know, Congressman Takano, you know, of the 41st District of California. You serve as the chairman of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs. Of course, you're co-chair of the Equality Caucus. Uh, can, you, can you talk a little bit about uh, what it's like being a caucus chairman, or pardon me, a committee chairman, uh, a leader in the caucus, uh, during this pandemic, but also uh, as an LGBT person of color? Uh, well, thank you for that introduction. Uh, you know, uh, I think I'm the only openly LGBT chairman of a full committee. And uh, with that chairmanship uh, comes um, a much enhanced staff reach. Uh, really, your power and reach in Congress is reflected in the, uh, the, the number of people that you have able to do uh, the work on the priorities that, uh, that you have as a member. And um, so all of you who are uh, members of the you know, LGBTQ Staff Association and uh, LGBTQ interns, um, I think you're understanding just how much uh, of a role that you have to play. So um, uh, those of you who've been interning, those of you who've been on, on the Hill, uh, understand uh, the degree to which uh, members like uh, such as Sharice and myself uh, really depend upon high quality, you know, uh, highly skilled, highly analytical uh, helpers. Um, you know, I'm on a weekly call uh, with uh, the executive in charge of vet the Veterans Health Administration, 170 uh, medical centers across the country. It's the nation's largest public, uh, publicly run uh, and publicly owned uh, medical provider uh, or providers of, of healthcare. Uh, those are actually hospitals. Those are actually doctors and nurses that are employed directly by uh, the VA and the VA plays a um, people don't know this but beyond giving uh, its primary focus uh, on veteran health care the VA also has responsibility for when uh, the civilian health care system breaks down in natural disasters and national disasters such as one we have now and so um, I've been able to you know keep abreast and actually be informed about uh, where hotspots are breaking, uh, breaking out, uh, and where the VA 
needs to respond in those hot spots. Uh, the southern uh, border of Texas, South Texas, Florida, Arizona, uh, even California, the VA has played an active role. Um, we also, I've also had insights into infection control uh, or the lack of it in our nation's nursing homes and state veterans homes. So let me, let me stop there because I know we only have a short time together, but uh, you know, I, that's a little bit of what it's like to be a, a chairman in a, in, a, in a pandemic crisis. Thank you, Chairman. And you know, VA's fourth mission is incredibly important during this pandemic. Uh, and you know, your oversight uh, of, of their action as an LGBT uh, chairman of the committee is, is truly historic. So I thank you for your leadership, sir. Uh, yeah. And Congresswoman Davids, uh, thank you again for joining us. Uh, Cong the Congresswoman represents the third district of Kansas. You're a member of our fantastic freshman class. Uh, and a member of the prestigious TNI committee as well as the Small Business Committee. Uh, so, Congresswoman, uh, you know, as a member of the freshman class, we're now a year and a half into our term. Uh, you know, what what lessons have you learned? What was it like? Uh, you know, as an LGBT woman, uh, as a freshman, navigating this space that you know the interns on this call uh, have have had to navigate. But but your experience as a member. Um, well, I mean, that's a, that's a great, a great question. And it's interesting because I think that uh, any time in history would probably be an interesting time uh, to be a member of Congress, but uh, certainly uh, our class has, um, I mean, in some ways, I, I, when I first started, I would joke that getting sworn into a shutdown government was not the history that we thought we would be making it uh, with this specific freshman class. But, um, you know, it's definitely been really tumultuous. And uh, there's just a lot of adjustments that it takes to go from uh, being what I felt like was just you know, your kind of ordinary uh, citizen. I had done some policy work before this, but I actually hadn't, I never did an internship on the Hill. I had never worked with anyone in Congress before. And so um, it was a really steep learning curve. And um, I think one of the biggest, uh, I don't know if I'd call it challenges, but one of the steepest part of the learning curve is just like figuring out how the Hill works. Uh, you know, some of the things like, uh, I remember one of my first uh, funny interactions with my chief of staff. Uh, I was like, what's with all these letters? Um, and I'm sure uh, the folks <laughs> here know about the like multitude of letters that get sent around. And um, now that I've been here for a little while, I see the importance of them and what, you know, it, it, the role that especially dear colleague letters can play in informing um, our uh, caucus and, and other members about things, but um, there's a, a lot of like quirky things about working on the Hill that uh, were uh, sometimes funny and sometimes just kind of confusing, but um, I think I think that's one piece and that's something that, I, that like everybody that's a freshman member I imagine goes through. Uh, and then I, I think that coming in as one of you know, I, alongside Deb Halland, who's the other Native American woman who was elected this time around, um, and part of, uh, you know, the, uh, the Equality Caucus, essentially doubling in, in size in terms of the uh, number of um, out folks who are part of our community, was, um, I, I think because of how many of us there were, it really, I, I, I think I probably felt a little less um, isolated. I don't know if that's the right word, but, um, you know, I think that sometimes being the only person in a, in a group or in a space that's, uh, like you, uh, can feel a little bit isolating sometimes. And so, um, I think I had imagined that that might happen, but it, it ended up not happening because, you know, I mean, Mark and David, obviously, um, uh, uh as, uh, uh, more senior members were super helpful, um, just like getting, getting, helping get acclimated, but also just being a, um, like having advocated and, um, you know, been working on legislation that's impactful uh, for so many years. Um, it was a, it was a pleasant, it, 
it was a much more pleasant experience maybe even than I had uh, anticipated, even with all of the um, chaos that was going on around us during this past year and a half. Yes, and thank you, Molly. And as folks on this call, uh, the concept of history is the first key at Native person to Congress. Uh, and, and we thank you so much for your leadership. And, and just a quick follow up, Congresswoman, uh, you know, as somebody who's had to navigate uh, this space uh, as a freshman, uh, you know, there are many interns on this call. And, you know, after your response, I'll throw it back to Congressman Takano. But, uh, you know, what's the advice that you would give for folks who, you know, potentially wouldn't have had a uh, colleague in Congresswoman Holland, uh, but would still need to try and acclimate uh, to this environment or potentially, you know, without experience in Congress, uh, maybe came from the nonprofit space, but would like to build a future here. Uh, you know, what advice would you give them? Yeah, you know, what's really interesting is the, um, the like variety of experience that exists. Uh, I think it's really interesting. And one of the things that I try to do is um, find places, uh, find whether it's issue areas or, or something like that with folks that I can um, just start to build off of, if that makes sense. So um, there's a number of folks like Colin Allred and I are, uh, you know, I mean, he's from, he's from Texas uh, and uh, he's also an attorney and practiced in the civil rights space and voting rights area. Uh, but he was in, an, he played in the NFL and I, did mixed martial arts. Um, uh, and so I think that like, there's been a couple of folks like Colin who right off the bat, I just found something for us to talk about whether it was working out or, or something. And I think that like, a lot of times that ends up happening around something like with me, infrastructure or transportation or something where I just find somebody to like kind of geek out with. And um, I, I feel like that's probably one of the places where I would, if I'm trying to like reach out and, and build relationships, that's the first thing that I usually do is try to figure out who has some kind of interest outside of the specific thing. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, uh, there are so many amazing like things going on in DC at any given time. Now they're all virtual, but um, you know, when I was doing my White House Fellows program, uh, I would often just find stuff and uh, attend, whether it was talks or um, some sort of lecture series or something like that. Um, and, and I think that those are really great ways to uh, build out um, a professional support network, if you will, because that's, uh, I mean, so many people are here and here, I'm here in Kansas, but, you know, in D.C., um, so many folks go out to DC because they're like literally trying to change the world. And uh, there's no shortage of like really interesting people to start making those connections with now. Um, you know, and so that's what I would, that's what I would normally be doing if I weren't, uh, didn't have a, at least some built in network with the various caucuses. That, that's great advice, Congresswoman. Thank you. And, you know, especially during the time of COVID, um, you know, don't be afraid to cold email someone. Uh, you know, you might share a passion for mixed martial arts uh, or for football or, or, or what have you. Um, Congressman Takano, uh, you know, along those same lines, I, I know that you've been a champion, you know, ever since the onset of the COVID pandemic uh, when it comes to the Asian, uh, anti-Asian sentiment that we've seen, um, you know, as, you know, queer people and queer people of color, uh, interns navigate these professional spaces, especially during the time of COVID. Uh, can you talk a little bit about your work that you've done to, uh, you know, put an end to that, but also, uh, you know, what should folks, uh, you know, be mindful of, uh, you know, as, as they navigate spaces, uh, you know, in terms of what you've experienced as a leader uh, who's also a queer person of color uh, and, and how did you overcome it? Well, <clears throat> um, I think uh, overcoming is sort of a, a word that I'd be careful of because uh, I think what the past four years have taught us it, and uh, what have taught us in terms of our political system is 
that there really uh, is a struggle of a lifetime, as John Lewis would put it. It's not the struggle of a, I mean, and I think for young people, it's, it's important to understand. I, I think the young people now who, who, who've come of age and have started to engage and participate uh, during the Trump era, as opposed to the Obama era, the, the Obama era made it look like progress was inevitable. And isn't this wonderful? And we've elected the first African-American president. And, um, and President Obama was opening up so many new things. And then uh, the recrimination started to happen when Donald Trump got elected. And um, I think uh, this moment teaches us that, we, that, uh, that things can go backwards, that progress is not inevitable, uh, and this idea of overcoming is something that uh, we constantly have to be doing. Uh, that being said, we can't live in a constant state of alarm and anxiety. Uh, and, um, but there are times to push back. And I was so proud of my colleague, Judy Chu, for so fiercely telling the caucus, don't you dare sign on to this bill uh that was coming uh, um, a John, a banks of indiana uh had this very punitive bill that would force china to admit that the virus started in china um and about 95 percent of his bill i had agreed with i i think that uyghur concentration camps are an abhorrence i think the uh the obliteration of the rights of the people of hong kong uh, is uh, it, it, we are in a weak a position, I, I think, because of the deterioration of our alliances. But f to permit a president to stigmatize an entire, entire racial group by calling a virus which comes from nature uh, the Wuhan virus or the China virus, or to ascribe it to a national uh, geographic origin. Um, you know that the great influenza, which many uh, medical scientists now call the flu pandemic of 1918, commonly known as the Spanish flu, a big misnomer with all, and you know, um, I mean no disrespect to Charisse because actually I've just finished reading three or four chapters of the book, The Great Influenza. And with, and not even conclusively now, but but a lot of uh, science seems to indicate a lot of retrospective science seems to indicate that the great influenza of 1918, if you were going to call it by a geographic name, might have been called the Kansas flu, uh, because it seemed to have originated uh, in the agricultural frontier where chickens, livestock, and pigs, everything intermixed and um, the avian transference of that influenza strain might have, might have happened, and some might even say it probably happened in Kansas, although we can't like say it for sure. There, there's, some, there's, some hard of, there's some very compelling evidence that it did. Well, what good does it do us to scapegoat and blame a particular people for what nature does? Uh, and it should be all of humanity all in together to uh, combat something that nature has done. And we can't make nature bad either. Nature is very fascinating, amazing. I got, I, I'm even more fascinated by what I've been reading. So uh, by, about the flu and how RNA works and uh, how ingenious this, this, uh, this uh, virus is. Um, so I think we, we need to, you know, push back, uh, speak, speak the truth. The difference between now and say 1941 when my parents were put into internment camps is that we have a more diverse Congress and we have more diverse voices who understand what it means to be scapegoated. We in the LGBTQ community understand scapegoating. We understand what happened with AIDS in the 1980s. We understand the indifference of uh, a research uh, component of the government that didn't really look into AIDS, uh, you know, AIDS treatments. And it was actually, and this is a sobering thought, 
There still is no vaccine for AIDS. And uh, treatments didn't come for AIDS until about 15 years after uh, it started in the United States in a serious way. Again, we got to be prepared for the long haul, and we've got to prepare ourselves spiritually, emotionally. But we also, as, rep as a representative of both LGBTQ and uh, a racial minority, uh, we've got to speak. I feel it's my duty to speak up and to warn and fight back against uh, scapegoating, stigmatization, blame, uh, and to remind everyone that fighting a virus is really a common and humane effort. That's a great point, Congressman, especially for the current and young leaders on this call, uh, you know, when it comes to pushing back. And, uh, you know, Congresswoman, you know, while, while we know the great leadership that, uh, you know, our LGBT members, and particularly you and Congressman Takano have had uh, in the caucus, uh, you know, there is a time to build bridges and build coalitions, uh, you know, certainly across the aisle, something I know Chairman Takano has done uh, with the Veterans Affairs Committee, but Congresswoman, uh, how have you taken that opportunity, particularly in this divisive time uh, that seems more divisive than ever, to be frank, uh, and, and what lessons can interns who, who certainly might be coming in with um, you know, in, an agenda and one that uh, is just, how, how do you, uh, you know, build bridges there as well? Yeah, that's a, um, it's a great question. So one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier, which is transportation and infrastructure, um, you know, I sit on a, uh, on two committees that are actually um, traditionally pretty bi bipartisan, whether it's a small business or transportation infrastructure committees. So um, I, so when I'm in those actual, I mean, Again, we're all in this virtual world, right? But um, that was a, that's a time when I will try to have conversations with uh, members that I might not otherwise uh, come across. Um, and a lot of times I'll listen for things that they say in those uh, hearings and you know, go talk to them afterwards about like, oh, you mentioned this thing about estuaries. It's very interesting. I'd love to have a further conversation about that. Maybe we can work together on something. Um, so that's, so like, like in the weeds on the day to day, how do we do that? That's um, what comes to mind. Um, I think that also, I don't, I mean, I don't know how many folks um, have know a ton about the uh, tribal federal relationship, but uh, when it comes to uh, native issues and tribal uh, government issues, uh, there's a lot of times there's a lot of bipartisan support for those um, for those issues and um, for like a variety of different reasons but it, it provides a place where we can really uh, start conversations uh, and, and build relationships in a bipartisan way the other thing I look at is um, you know I'm I'm from a state where I'm the only federal uh, elected that's uh, in the Democratic caucus um, but we're also in the majority. So I think that one of the things that has been really helpful is uh, just asking the rest of the Kansas delegation what's going on, um, you know, what's going on in the western part of the state. I'm not out there. I don't know. But, uh, you know, if there are things that are coming up um, that we can work together on for the benefit of the entire state, let me know. And some of that stuff has been like uh, rural broadband. I mean, access to broadband is an issue um, in lots of in lots of communities, and you know, rural communities are certainly part of that. Uh, traditionally marginalized communities are certainly part of that, and uh, so I, I spend a lot. I do feel like I spend a lot of time trying to figure out what are you know what are the things that we can come to some kind of agreement on, um, and frankly, I don't spend a lot of time. Like I'm not spending time trying to convince. Uh, any of my Republican colleagues about the like validity of my autonomy over my own body. You know, I don't, I, it doesn't feel like a good use of time, but talking about rural broadband and the ways that we can get uh, bridge the digital divide does feel like it, it's a good use of, of my time and energy. So, um, and, I, and I think that also, because I think a lot of times, uh, you know, it's, 
it, it kind of feels like a bit heavy and overwhelming um, to try to figure out like, well, how do I, what am I supposed to talk to them about around this issue or that issue? And um, on, on like things where you know it's just gonna be butting heads, like that is to me is an intentional uh, approach of like, am I gonna use my energy today on this thing? Um, and, and try to have the fight because sometimes that is worth it. Um, or today, am I going to use my energy on trying to figure out what, you know, where can we, where can we, uh, cross a, a smaller, a smaller gap? Yeah, that priority of energy and effort uh, is key. And that harkens back to your earlier answer of finding common interests, uh, which can certainly work on the micro level as an intern, but clearly at the macro level as a representative in Congress. Uh, so thank you, Congresswoman Davids. And, you know, we want to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, flexible here and, and respectful of your time. Uh, so uh, I think Congressman Takano and Congressman Davids might have to leave soon. But if there's any, uh, you know, final words of advice for interns and advocacy leaders who this summer, you know, like we all are living through the throes of COVID, words of advice, words of hope as we look forward uh, to being on the other side of this crisis. November's not that far away. Um, no, but seriously, I think one of the things that has been very uh, heartening for me is, first of all, we've seen, I mean, we're, right now we're like very much, um, and especially as a freshman member, uh, very much waiting to see whether or not we're gonna have another bipartisan relief bill. And like, I know the like anxiety that comes along with like not being sure if you're going to be able to pay your bills uh, or like potentially getting evicted um, and like how uh, it can like make you freeze and like you have that tightness in your chest and all that stuff. Um, so I hope that we see something soon, but we have seen a number of bipartisan coronavirus relief packages. Um, like no package is perfect, but like the fact that we've seen so like five or six of them so far, it gives me hope. Um, and then the fact that we see so many people across the country who are so fired up about what we can do uh, collectively um, and in coalition with each other to make a difference. Uh, I feel like those are like, it just, it's a demonstration of the optimism that people have for what the future can look like and their impact on the future. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, to me, that is, it's inspiring and it's, um, it, it, it feeds my optimism for sure. And I appreciate you guys doing this and having me here. Thank you so much for being here, Congresswoman. Uh, great advice. Take care. Congressman Takano, uh, same question. Any final words of hope or advice? Um, well, um, for those of you who are interning, uh, I know that, uh, and those of you who are junior staffers, uh, I know one thing that this moment, uh, one particular hardship this moment has brought to you is that uh, there are no receptions on the Hill. So I'm worried about your nutrition. And I only say that half jokingly because I had a staffer who actually uh, knew exactly where to go uh, to get a meal. And um, so, um, you know, that's, uh, I, I throw that there as sort of a point of humor, but also um, as a point of seriousness too. Um, I know that you don't work for, you know, uh, exorbitant wages, uh, far from it. And, uh, and getting through this moment is requiring, you know, a huge amount of, of uh, summoning of, of, uh, of, of, you know, your own personal emotional resources uh, and guile to get through it. What I would say, though, is that, um, and I want to just kind of walk back a little bit of my warning about how it took 15 years to get treatments for HIV AIDS. We already have seen some breakthroughs with treatments, and um, there are some hopeful signs about a vaccine. But nevertheless, I, I do believe that we have to be realistic uh, in terms of what challenges we're facing uh, and to pre prepare for us all, prepare ourselves accordingly, that we can't expect things to just uh, disappear. Uh, as some people have said, the virus will just disappear one day. Um, that we have to, in, in the sense that John Lewis 
uh, the late John Lewis, talked about not allowing bad news uh, or not getting lost in a sea of despair. Um, I mean, preparing yourselves for a, a longer haul. Uh, and that to me is social justice. That to me is uh, fighting back against income inequality. That means, um, you know, fighting for racial, um, true racial equality in our country. These are not problems that will be solved in one Congress, one relief bill. Uh, we can make a big uh, try at it, but, but as you begin to formulate what your purpose is, uh, and what will animate your spirit and your determination and grit. I suggest to you um, that it's in these larger purposes. Um, John Lewis lived inside the purpose of social justice, uh, and it caused him to live his life in a certain way. Um, and it delimited certain choices that he made. And um, I can look back at my life and say, you know, that I that there are some similarities in terms of the choices or there's some, there, there were the limitations on the choices I made because of the, the purpose I chose to live in. So um, that's my parting word of advice and to discover that purpose. What is it for you? Um, pandemics, this moment is a good time to actually think about what that is. Thank you, Congressman. And like you said, these issues won't be solved in a term, but we thank you so much for your leadership in fighting every day to address these issues. Uh, thank you again for being with us and for uh, partnering with the LGBTCSA and the Congressional Equality Caucus once again. And, um, you know, keep up the fight, Congressman. Thank you for your leadership. Great honor and privilege. Pleasure to be here. Thank you.